Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It was moving day on a Saturday in June 1962. We moved into a community, Marynook. It was a planned community, planned for a, a bedroom community for the staff and faculty of the University of Chicago on the far south side of Chicago. It was very exclusive, white collar professional, and it even had a covenant about how you were to behave in this neighborhood. I was 11 years old and unaware that we were the third black family to move into Mary Nook. And soon after arriving, my mother sent me to the store about four blocks away. And those four blocks were the longest I ever walked. Teenagers drove by in convertibles, calling me nigger and throwing eggs at me, both coming and going. I walked home somewhat in shock with the milk and the eggs and the bread. I was humiliated. I was embarrassed, you know, as only teens can be. I was embarrassed to be black in a white neighborhood, but I was also very, very angry. My mother pulled me inside. She didn't ask me what was wrong. I think she already knew. And she just said to me, point blank, the man next door is a minister, a pastor of a Presbyterian church. Neither she or I knew what that was. <laughs> she said, he came over and said, it will be hard for you here in Mary Nook, but he has two black girls in his church that are your age. So starting Monday, you will be attending vacation Bible school with him. <laughs> <sighs> well, I didn't know what to think or feel. Matter of fact, I really didn't know if I was allowed to think about it or to feel anything about it. So Monday came at 9 a.m. and I met him in the driveway, a tall, medium build white man, the Reverend Don Morris. Again, I was confused in my feelings. We got in his car and as we drove to Chatham United Presbyterian Church, three miles away, I slowly began to warm with his easy and kind voice and his way with me. He knew I was confused. And I learned once I arrived there that this white church was in a presbytery committed to civil rights. Committed not just to the all-white Mary Nook and Chatham area that they might get mobilized. They weren't just mobilized about civil rights in the neighborhoods immediately around Mary Nook and Chatham. They were committed to ending segregation in Chicago public schools. That was their focus and they made partnership with black inner city neighborhoods across the ecumenical boundaries. They went into Woodlawn, they went into Inglewood, very tough black inner city neighborhoods to organize with them for civil rights. After that summer, I continued going to Chatham United Presbyterian Church and was baptized there a few years later. I stayed there because I, I wanted to continue in their witness to the gospel because I knew there that it didn't matter really the color of my skin as much as that God loved me. That's where I learned that God loved me. And that they claimed that they were holding up the universality of the integrity of all human beings. And so with Chatham United Presbyterian Church, I marched with Martin Luther King and the SCLC as a teenager through the city's streets downtown with hundreds and thousands of people. I don't know how many times we marched, maybe six, seven, eight. We even went out to Skokie where we were spat upon again. We marched together as Christians, Muslims, Jews, and other religious groups demanding the end of Jim Crow in housing and in education. In these marches, in the sermons and discussions at my church, the passion for justice, that is the gospel of justice, took root in me. You see, it wasn't just about community organizing, but rather, I found quickly out, it was faith organizing for justice. So my passion continued, and as a rector in Rochester, 
I was involved in community organizing again. Now, you have to know that Rochester was not, this was not shocking to my people because this was the home of the biggest event in Saul Alinsky's life about Kodak. And they carried that, that proud heritage of being a place of justice with, of course, Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony and others who lived in Rochester. So I went off for training as a trainer at the Pacific Institute of Community Organizing. I did this just as our, our county executive sought to rid downtown Rochester of the homeless and of especially black teenagers who gathered downtown after school. But his main target, the county executive Doyle had, was the indigent who were housed in a converted hotel just behind my church, like across the alley. He wanted to rid them out of the area because he saw them as an embarrassment to downtown Rochester. So a few of us pastors and rabbis and an imam or two met together at a local community organizer's office. And we began to raise our voices against the cruel and the politically expedient plan of the, of the county executive. We demanded time and interviews in our local newspaper, the DNC, which is what they did to the news quite often, <laughs> the Democrat and Chronicle of Rochester. We sent letters to the editor. We got on the local radio and TV outlets. We preached from our pulpits. We forged coalitions with the ACLU and other uh, civic groups, with fraternities and sororities and social service groups. We invited the community to join us at a large gathering to talk about this move to drive out those who were most helpless, people with mental illness and handicaps who were living in this converted hotel. And so we gathered at our church, St. Luke and St. Simon Cyrene Episcopal Church. And under the pressure of the TV and the radio and the newspaper and it being across the city of Rochester, the county executive was forced to send his senior staff to speak with us, but more so to listen to our concerns about pushing out the indigent. We asked for a longer period of time for planning that they might live places where there was still public access to transportation and social services, that they not be forced out as individuals scattered throughout the community, but rather in groups because they knew each other, they found comfort in it. We brought into public focus and notice that we stand for justice in a time of cruelty. And our church, St. Luke and St. Simon Cyrene became aligned with that focus. And people began to come. Some even stayed. Because they saw that St. Luke and St. Simon Cyrene together walked the talk of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus who didn't have a home himself. Depended on others for food. Who saved others and healed others and not himself. He didn't do it for recognition or honor, to display power, or even to feel good about himself. He did it because of the love of God. He did it from living his faith. A few lit years later, the now abandoned hotel was brought, bought and destined for implosion for a new parking lot. <laughs> the demolition company that was planning to do it was moving quickly ahead with its plan before we could protect our historic building, which was the oldest building in Rochester and had a 1922 Skinner three panel organ that had to have the pipes and everything, you know, sealed because of the dust from an implosion. But because of our witness, when this hit the news, because of our ministry of community organizing, the community came back and supported us at Two Saints. They cried aloud that there needed to be more time that we might prepare especially when it was discovered that the company that we were dealing with, the, with the demolition, was owned and operated by the Mafia. <laughs> it was. <laughs> we had built a relationship with the community and the community itself, no matter what religious or non-religious tradition people were a part of. 
the community identified with us. Community organizing itself is a good thing. But for us who are Christians, it has got to be a biblical mandate. As Jesus said, for as you give, help, uplift, liberate to these, the little ones, the oppressed, the old, the young, the immigrants, the physically and mentally handicapped, the black, the white, the yellow, as you do it unto them, so you do it unto me. People involved in community organizing can be altruistic, but for me, and I hope for you, it can't be just a good thing to do. It cannot be. It must not be. It is not a substitute for the church. It is not there for us to feel good about ourselves. You can do that by giving to PBS, as I do. <laughs> <laughs> or walking against breast can cancer, or hunger, or being a part of the Best Buddies ride with Tom Brady. And I'd like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I got a thing for that man. Anyhow. <laughs> All that is good, and it's doing good. But for Reverend Donald Morse, and for us, as the Rochester community understood, we organize to serve, to serve our God. And it is a matter, it must be a matter of faith. The times may have changed from that Saturday in 1962, but it hasn't. We have Ferguson the findings there, and in Cleveland, and Chicago, the Coptics who were killed in Tunisia, the people in the Holy Land, and even here in Boston. The times have not changed when it comes to oppression and suffering. We are called to live the gospel, and it is a gospel of justice. Because you see, living out the gospel of justice isn't just about community organizing. It is about faith organizing for justice.